I've got this Henry Henchy drawing that is in vine charcoal, and I wanted to show you initially the overall sense and the composition because the placement of the head is really beautifully suggested, and there's real solidity. Do you feel it? It's solid. It's robust. There's a kind of construction to it. And so what I want to do is kind of zero in. I've got my little remote control here, and I want you to notice as I zero in, I know it's kind of awkward, so just bear with me for a second, but as I get closer and closer, there's a kind of dissolution of the form sense. Even though you would think that everything would be very exacting in through here, you'd get a sense of all of the total solidity of the form and the idea of conspicuous structures and through here and all through there. It actually kind of dissolves and you don't get an edge. I'm going to keep going unless uh, it's too close. This is one of the great things about our adventures together here on Zoom. It's just something really wonderful about the way that he's captured the individual. There's a real sense of the construction, like I'm saying. Do you see these indications? They're so precise. This moment of the lacrimal duct, we were talking about that the other night in the critique and how much the lacrimal fossa anchors the eye. And so he's got a real softness, again, this wonderful place around which he's not giving you an exact point of reference. He's got a kind of softer intersection of form. He's got a beautiful uplifting form sensing through here. And then he has this just marvelous little thing that captures the person. I really think that her essence is in this drawing. It's pretty cool how we can do this, right? Let me just move my camera. You know, there's something about the way that he worked that really got me interested in Hatchmark. Because this thing is nothing if not a symphony of yeah. exquisite mark making. It's just like, I talked about the network of linear intrigue in one of the videos, and there's just something about an artist traversing and interlacing the form. It's like the whole thing is just so beautifully thought through. And I can tell you a bit about the artist. This is Henry Henschy. He was born in 1899 in Germany. He emigrated, like Rayberger, to Chicago at a young age and wound up becoming an art star in his own right, studied in the Art Institute. Apparently, he was introduced to real color painting when some students showed up in Chicago and their work really caught his imagination. They captivated him and he wanted to know where they had studied color. And they said, we went and worked with this guy named Charles Hawthorne in Provincetown. So that changed Henchy's whole life, his whole existence. And he moves to Provincetown, I think in 1919. And he wound up becoming the assistant to Charles Hawthorne, who really was one of the biggest of big deal instructors. Henchy called him the most important instructor of American painting in the history of the country. And Henchy became his assistant and uh, later was uh, the one that took over the school in 1930 when Hawthorne passed of renal failure. In the early 1930s, Henry Henschey was teaching the classes and becoming his own painter and instructor and really proselytizing about color. He was all about color. I think this influences his drawing because what you see in his drawing is a real flatness. It's like a flat shape accuracy. And I mean flatness in a very respectful way. He had a, an amazing capacity in his drawing to capture the accuracy and the perceptual information that's in the person, in the good sense to know where and how much to emphasize. And I'm going to put my hand out here so you can see the general scale of this drawing. There's something else that you might find interesting other than me gushing about all these forms. Like, I just love that little fold above the eye there and that marvelous kind of raised eyebrow to give her a sense of defiance. This lady, I believe, in fact, I'm certain of it, this was a, a drawing that I purchased portrait of a woman and they didn't know who it was but I know it's his wife and the reason I know it's his wife is because wow. this is a drawing from around 1934 and it's the same person in the same wow. position isn't that cool this is a photograph it's a bad photo but now, her name was Ada Rayner she came over to the US as an English nanny and she became his first wife Dottie and she became his second wife you know he went on to fame and glory as a colorist but it's interesting just how much his drawings have spoken to me. In terms of his technique, I spoke to a person that posed for another iconic drawing, a bit like this. The description that I heard, it was anecdotal, it was like oral histories, that kind of thing. He said that he posed three times. He said at the end of the first session of him posing, it was just like a cloudy mass. He said he didn't know what it was. It looked like a, almost like a Jackson Pollock. You know, there wasn't anything there. Just 
big masses of charcoal. This is vine charcoal, all of it. He said the second day he posed, it looked like a person. There was some sort of a sense of an individual coming out of the mist, so to speak. And he said the third day, he said, it was me. And so this gives you kind of an insight into the way that this artist, extraordinary draftsperson, would have constructed and built the drawing in this cohesive way to try to go after this network of forms. As I said, this intrigue, this just wonderful, awe-inspiring way of, of being so directionally flamboyant and cognizant of what he was trying to do and, and just take full advantage of the poetry. I think every mark in there is just a, like I said, a little, a little song, a little symphony. There's no wasted line. And so that's what appeals to me about this drawing. It's uh, in most cases we have that reductive or subtractive where he's going after these edges between uh, his hair shape and his his zygomatic. But here we have a conspicuous vine charcoal mark. So you had to think that the artist was sharpening constantly. And then look at the mouth, the way he's he's diffused the sense of the mouth and its intersection with this overall chin structure. Just a wonderful thing. There's a nice little indication in the eyelid right there where you get what you need. I think he does it in a couple of places. He does it on this eyelid, does it on that eyelid there. You don't really have to focus on the full eye. There's just a, a kind of indication for you of where the artist wants you to see what's going on. And he really pulls your attention toward the sharpness by an expert manipulation of the edges. It looks a lot like a chalk drawing, but it actually is a vine charcoal drawing. This is all vine charcoal, and it's on Michelet, and you can kind of see the fibers of the Michelet. Yeah. It may have been matted. Actually, i got to zoom out to show you. It may have been matted differently back in the old days because I'm getting a line. Do you see the line right around the edge and through here? It probably was matted with an earlier frame, which ended right about here. Let me go out even further. Hold on a second. There we go. And yeah, the earlier edge of the mat is right about there, right at the bottom of, of the TV. That also gives you a sense of what's going on. But I took this thing out of the frame when I purchased it and I reframed it and rematted it. This is a long time ago. And it was something that I needed to do because I wanted to put an acid free mat in. But there's a an inviting quality. So this idea again of looking at works that we own and uh, exuding about how much we love them and why we love them. There's something about how all the decisions that were made were integral to their effect. And the fact that this is a slightly smaller than life-size drawing does bring you in. It does pull you into the person and make you engage in a different way. It's kind of like miniature, you know, in the great Persian miniatures of which there are just some extraordinary paintings of the Shahnameh. Have you ever seen any of those images of the horsemen and the archers and I mean, some of those things are just incredible. If you go to the Sackler Museum in D.C., the Persian miniatures along with the calligraphy are just out of this world. So sometimes the scale, when it's smaller, is magnetic. Keep in mind, he did a lot of these in the evening. His students would pose for him. In this case, of course, it was his wife. And they would get him drunk because they wanted to hear him tell stories about the art business and about the art world. He had come of age in an era of great consequence. The armory show and the era of Sargent, that Gilded Age coming to a conclusion. He knew a lot of the key players and he knew people like Denman Ross. Denman Ross gets spoken of a lot these days. He was the big theorist over at Harvard University and talked a lot about tonality and color theory and yeah. was kind of a precursor to, yeah. to Munsell and, and, uh, and some of the other ones, Johannes Eaton and, and such. And he had students that were noteworthy. Franz Klein was a student of Henry Henschey, and he knew a lot of the painters in that early group of people that worked with Hawthorne, like Edwin Dickinson. So he would have been a fascinating guy to sit down with, and he was very well read. So this was part of what must have made listening to him draw and speak such an entertaining experience for people who had gone the extra step, moved to Provincetown to really get involved in a meaningful way in the depth of study which was required in those days. The wife that I knew was wife number two and she died September the 7th of 2002. She was just marvelous. She was so wonderful. She had been, she was ill and she was on, she had been uh, intubated, you know, so it was a tough, it was a tough thing. She had died of a respiratory infection. But I don't know when Ada passed. I think Ada might have passed in the late 80s. He was the color painter 
of his time in a very important environment. I mean, remember you had the Boston School, you had Robert Douglas Hunter also working yeah. in Provincetown, you had multiple art schools. Hunter was the, in some ways, the heir of Gamel, R.H. Ives Gamel, so there was a lot going on in that region. He has this thing called the Cape School of Art, which he had since the 1930s, because he lived through the Great Depression. And, you know, it's just, you look into people's lives and there are all of these things which affect their lives profoundly, and most of them are negative, just like we see in our own lives. Our lives are affected by things, by failure, by tons of rejection, and you have to figure out a way to, to channel that and sort of absorb that and expel it in a way that gives you a boost, gives you an inspiration to try to, to make a newer, a finer day, a finer tomorrow because that's what your industry requires. It doesn't crave failure and depression. It craves inspiration and uh, exuberance for what the next piece can bring. And you do get a sense of that in his work, which is pretty nice. Certainly, there's a lot of influence here.